Hi everyone, this is Jason Bjork of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. I'd like to have him on every three or four months to get his opinion on Bitcoin. He's the host of the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast. He's a Bitcoin business angel investor. He's been in Bitcoin so many years, he was in it when it was way below a dollar. I consider him a renaissance man. He's also written a book called The Great Credit Contraction. Trace Meyer, thank you for joining me again. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be on your show again. Now, Trace, I want to ask you an interesting question here about the cost to mine Bitcoin. So there's a lot of people that are very enthusiastic about Bitcoin. Maybe they're in the retail space. They're probably not commercial miners. And I've heard from retail people that they don't care what the Bitcoin price is. They want, they'll just mine it on their old laptop or something like that, and they'll set it up. But do you think that it matters if people are mining Bitcoin at a loss, or do you think that that Bitcoin has to be mined profitably so there's an incentive then for commercial Bitcoin miners to verify transactions? Well, that's an that's a very interesting question. So the Ford network effect with Bitcoin is the mining or the security. And the reason the miners, at least the incentive uh, structure that we operate on is that we assume that the miners want to do it profitably. Uh, and so... You know, if people are engaged in some type of creative genius activity where they're not doing the work for the profitability profitability element, but instead they're doing the work because it's intrinsically rewarding in itself to do the work, like maybe they want to learn how Bitcoin works and so they want to figure out how to do the mining or something like this, then I don't really see that as an issue because the hash rate has just gotten so obscenely large that you're if this could be such an expensive hobby for people like if people want to engage in bitcoin mining just as a hobby and aren't worried about the profitability of it then they're going to burn a lot of money really fast and probably run out of their funds and and it just highlights like how competitive bitcoin mining has gotten how industrialized it's become uh whether it's the need to get uh, asics uh you know of the latest generation or whether it's finding really cheap high quality uh consistent power uh places that they can plug into you know all of this goes into it and it's a great thing that the Bitcoin network does because it shifts all of this risk onto the miners, on, onto this entrepreneurial activity. And so the hodlers and the users of Bitcoin are not really affected by all of the different individual decisions that are made as a result of that. So I've been researching this for a couple months now. Uh, I interviewed Frank Holmes, chairman of Hyde Blockchain Technology, a couple months ago. I'll put a link for our listeners to go back and listen to that interview. He said the cost for them to mine Bitcoin is $6,500 a coin. I found another article in March that from Fundstrat's Tom Lee, he wrote an extensive research report saying that it costs $8,300 all into mine Bitcoin. And there was a new article out on Coindesk in the last couple days. I'll attach a link to this for our listeners to check it out from the CEO of Random Crypto, Josh Metnick. And he just came up with a new algorithm trying to track the cost of the price. And he says there every single retail Bitcoin miner is losing money. No one can make a profit. So, you know, it was interesting when Bitcoin was at a lower price. I was like, well, I think, Almost everyone, according to the research I've looked at, is was running at a loss. So I didn't think that that was sustainable. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, that we have this fluctuation happening there. So you have two different components when you become a when you become a hodler of Bitcoin, like a hodler of last resort. You're exposed to the exchange rate risk of Bitcoin, but because you own it and hold the private keys yourself, you can never be shaken out of your position. Miners are not in the same situation. Miners have an, a second variable, the difficulty that they have to take into account in addition to the exchange rate of the, of the Bitcoin relative to their fiat currency. And in a lot of cases, their expenses are in dollars or euros or, or yen or whatever, whatever jurisdiction they're operating in. And so, you know, I, I don't know about whether these guesstimates about how much it costs to, to mine Bitcoin are actually accurate or not, because I think there's a tremendous amount of creativity that goes on in the Bitcoin ecosystem, especially the mining ecosystem, when it comes to finding good deals on power and good deals on equipment. And then you've got uh, hedging contracts that you can engage in, and you can use CME Futures or Ledger X to 
you know, contain some of your risk. And all of this is happening because Bitcoin mining is getting so much more industrialized and commercialized. So, you know, oh, and then, you know, if you're a very large Bitcoin manufacturer, Bitcoin mining manufacturer of the chips, in effect, you know, if you're selling these chips to the public, you want to sell them so that they're a loss to the public and take advantage of those unsophisticated actors that are making poor economic decisions because you know you can sell those chips at a profit uh, that will that will actually be a loss to them and there's a lot of asymmetric knowledge and information that's happening in the industry too such as how much new hash rates coming online when's it coming online all this stuff and so it would not surprise me if some of the big mining manufacturers uh, actively try to uh, do what they can with the Bitcoin price itself in order to sell new batches of mining equipment and then, uh, you know, kind of uh, <laughs> t take so the move, gains that move, way. So, so move the price then to lure more sales or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, temporarily, and you see this all the time. Uh, whether it's Dash miners, they just came out with Dash ASICs, or uh, you know the GPU cards. Like, well, not so much with the GPU cards, but mainly with the ASICs. And so, you know, hey, that's just kind of how the market works. And this is definitely a free market. And I don't know why everybody thinks that everyone should have access to all the same knowledge and information, because there's always going to be asymmetric knowledge and information. And some of these you know, things when it comes to, uh, you know, how much Bitcoin the mining companies want to hold versus sell, when they want to hold it, when they want to sell it, when they want to do that relative to their inventory. That's all kind of proprietary trade secret stuff. And, you know, just because you're on the other side and you get screwed over by one of these mining companies, which in effect are kind of like financial services companies taking a position opposite to their retail customers. You know, that's just, that just is what it is when you dance with the devil, like <laughs> don't, don't necessarily think it's going to be a good deal. Yeah. My rationale for trying to figure out the cost for Bitcoin mining somewhat accurately, I think it's probably in a range, you know, maybe it's somewhere in between those two ranges of the reports, but if Bitcoin is digital gold, shouldn't the miners have to eventually profit? Because we're seeing that right now with the actual physical gold miners, the physical gold miners cannot forever produce go mine gold at a loss. So they can, for a short amount of time, they can either figure out ways to reduce costs at their mine or borrow money or or sell shares or something or sell a mine eventually or something like that to delay time, delay bankruptcy. But, you know, at a certain point, they have to make a profit or otherwise they have to stop doing it. So uh, I have a question that kind of fits in with this is from my friend Phil Kennedy at Kennedy Financial. He's a big fan of yours. So in uh, he he's asking about hash rate. So does price follow hash rate or does hash rate follow price? Uh, hash rate follows price and it's a lagging indicator because the miners earn their block reward in Bitcoin, but their expenses are usually in the different fiat currencies, as I explained. And so they're going to be allocating the capital based on the expected return that they're going to get. Uh, and most of them are probably calculating in dollars or fiat in order to do that. They're not necessarily trying to maximize the number of Bitcoins they have, uh, although that's really what they should be doing. So lately, Trace, in the last couple of months, there's been 51% attacks on a lot of other altcoins. I guess they don't have the same setup of proof of work. Not all of them do compared to Bitcoin. So do you think that's the main reason? Or do you think there's a lot of other problems with these altcoins that have had 51% attacks compared to Bitcoin? Well, yeah, I mean, it's uh, we're talking about the security of the network, which is the fourth network effect. And some of these other coins are just not nearly as secure as Bitcoin is. And for example, Bitcoin Gold had a 51% attack and the exchange got hit for $18 million. Uh, you know, th this is a wonderful environment that we get to operate in that is adversarial. And if your blockchain is not fit for purpose and can be 51% reorged, if the mutability can be questioned, if the exchanges are not cautious enough, you know, that's a great way to flush out the incompetent actors, you know, taking $18 million losses. And so that's just kind of uh, part of the environment or kind of, you know, the lay of the land that we're dealing with here. You know, 
everybody, I, I see a lot of, a lot of uh, blockchain is immutable. No, it's not. Uh, Bitcoin has proven to be immutable, but not all blockchains are immutable. Ethereum's been, had been reorged, Ripple's been reorged, uh, Bitcoin Gold's been reorged on massive scales, uh, along with a lot of other these uh, of these other altcoins. And so you can't just assume that these blockchains are immutable. That's a bad security assumption. And if you do assume that, chances are you might get hit with a big enough loss to. Uh, kind of encourage you not to have that assumption anymore. The thing is, is that everybody like under, everybody seems to under appreciate the amount of risk that they take on uh, just in their situations. Do you, do you think the 51% attack of at least five altcoins recently is the reason why Bitcoin dominance is increasing again because Bitcoin dominance, what it was down to out of all the crypto market caps, it was down to below 40% for a while. And now it's back up. Let me pull up crypto market cap real quick, coinmarketcap.com. And it's back up to almost 49%. So 48.7%. We're recording this on Thursday, August 2nd, 2018. Yeah. I mean, I don't put much stock in the Bitcoin dominance index because one, it doesn't really take into account liquidity at all. And that's super important when we're dealing with large positions and wanting to move large amounts of capital in and out. I mean, big deal if you've got some altcoin with a billion units of the altcoin that only has a thousand of them trading and you and you pump the price really high. Uh, there's no real liquidity there for those you know billion total units out there. But Bitcoin's very liquid. Uh, OTC desks, exchanges, everything. And the Bitcoin dominance index doesn't take that into account. The other thing is, you know, during corrections and consolidations in bear markets, uh, you know, we just kind of bleed out the altcoins. You know, what, what fundamental value proposition do these things add? I mean, most of them are just pumping up Ponzi scam, ICO, fraudulent securities offerings, like just piece of jokes. And, and then we got all of these forks, and the forks are jokes too. There's nothing real and substantive happening there. Like, why are people buying and hodling this stuff? Well, maybe they're not anymore because the hot money and the dumb money is, uh, you know, just getting bled out. So, you know, it's, uh, that's just kind of what happens. It's part of the cycle. Now, I know you talk to a lot of sophisticated investors like hedge fund guys, big money Wall Street types, institutional investors who are looking to get into the space. So recently, now that Bitcoin's been having a correction, we've heard press releases from George Soros in April that some of his hedge funds wanted to start buying some of the largest cryptocurrencies. Mark Andreessen has put out a press release recently, too, that he was going to put in an additional $300 million of his capital into Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Is that uh, one of the reasons why you think Bitcoin has been rallying that a lot of uh, institutional money, smart money has finally started to increase positions in cryptocurrency as well? Well, not so much. I think they're buying it in a very sophisticated way, trying not to move the market as much as they can. Plus, the market is correcting and consolidating and digesting this massive move to $19,600. I mean, you look at the 12-month chart on Bitcoin, it's still up like over, it's still up a, a very healthy return. And Bitcoin's healthier and fundamentally than it's ever been. And so, you know, a lot of these players that, that run to 19,000, CME futures getting launched, not blowing up the financial system. They've been around eight months now. Like, everybody's starting to dip their toes in. But they're, they're all doing it very cautiously, you know, and they're trying to do it at the best price possible, too. So, so this is going to be a lengthy accumulation process, and you think so the big money like the George Soros's and Dreesons, they're not going to go in and buy large positions every single day. They're going to be accumulating over months, perhaps even over a year. Uh, I don't know what their strategies are. I mean, if they can buy large blocks OTC, then you know that's probably what they'll do. But then next thing you know, Bitcoin runs again. Like we saw it go up 7% in a day. I mean, the, like this thing is a wild animal. And it, it, there's almost more risk not having a position than there is trying to get the best price on a position. And so I don't know what their individual strategies are. Uh, you know, and maybe they're hedging in order to acquire positions, selling puts, uh, buying calls, stuff like that. I mean, that's every every hedge fund, every shop's doing their own thing. 
And that's one of the beautiful things about Bitcoin, you know, and some people are going to be left behind on the train. You know, they're not going to be hodlers, even though they they thought it was a good idea because they missed buying it by 25 cents on the price. Right. They they wanted it at eighty four seventy five instead of eighty five hundred. It's a good point. And another reason that Bitcoin may be rallying, too, is that, you know, all the problems that we have with central banks and governments and fiat currency. And the U.S. and China are in a trade war. At least there's big talk of a trade war. I'm not sure exactly how many tariffs have been put on yet. There's been threats back and forth of a lot of tariffs. Not sure of the exact number of tariffs that are actually on yet. But China did a RMB devaluation of more than 6% in a short amount of time. And if you're a Chinese saver, Chinese small business owner, Chinese saver, you have savings, and maybe you were in cash, and you remember that there, China in the past, only about 20 years ago, I think, did a 60% RMB devaluation overnight. So do you think then that the RMB devaluation recently, that's going to be a factor then if China is going to continue to devalue their own currency that people in China are probably going to go into crypto again? It should be for the Chinese people, but we have no idea what they're, uh, what they're thinking. You know, Google just talked about how they're rolling out a, a, a censored version of a search engine over there. I mean, who knows if, if most Chinese even know what a Bitcoin is. Maybe it's censored by the Great Firewall. Like, we don't know. But, you know, the people are very creative and very ingenuitive, and they figure out ways around these problems, whether it's China, whether it's Venezuela, or, you know, you haven't talked about Turkey. I think Turkey's definitely a dark horse in terms of massive Bitcoin adoption and stuff going on, uh, especially for a lot of these reasons. Plus, in the U.S., we have interest rates being raised. I mean, the Fed paused for a little bit, but they'll keep going up. Whereas in other places, you know, we, we still have quantitative easing and other stuff going going on. And so you have to look at like negative real returns, the risk appetite, the the their, their central bank policy, if that even matters. I mean, it's still mostly a retail market that's in the Bitcoin space anyways. So, I mean, it's just, I, I mean, there, there are 7 billion people on this planet and they're all thinking different things and making different bets. And somehow it comes out into the Bitcoin price, like, you know, what people are thinking about it. And so, you know, that's ultimately the only thing we really have to go on. And, but remember, Bitcoin is strictly limited in amount. So it's very difficult to manipulate the Bitcoin price, unlike dollars or yen or euros, especially on these large scales, because you actually have to deliver the Bitcoin. I think cryptocurrency trading is still really popular in Asia, even though the prices are down a lot, especially if there is a rally. We, we've known for trading volumes that the largest trading volumes for crypto exchanges are still in Japan and South Korea, and I think the second one is Europe. So although we see a lot of the news coverage of Bitcoin here in the, here in the United States, the trading volumes say that, that cryptocurrency, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is still more popular in Asia and Europe. Well, I mean, that's what at least these public numbers state. But I mean, how do we know those are accurate? And how do we know that those are real uh, numbers that have veracity to them? Uh, I I think that China is probably largely a, very much a, a paper dragon when it comes to their Bitcoin activity. In terms of actual people on the ground using Bitcoin, it seems like the U.S. and Europe is where the activity is really happening. Sure, there's some speculation going on in Korea or, or China or whatnot, but I don't think it's got the actual usage uh, like we see in these other markets. So for our listeners who are not familiar, what's the Meyer multiple and how did you come up with it? Yeah, so I didn't come up with it. Uh, well, I guess I came up with the methodology. Preston over at Investors Podcast, he's the one who made the site and named it and everything. I wouldn't really name something like that after me. But it does serve a very useful purpose. And what we do is we have the 200-day moving average divided. We have the current price divided by the 200-day moving average. And this gives us a relative price. And then with the relative price, we're able to look at that over time. And then we're able to see, like, when is Bitcoin expensive and when is Bitcoin cheap? And we can do that just based on standard deviations from the mean. And so right now we're at 0.90 uh, on the Mayer multiple. That, that means that about 78% of the time that Mayer multiple is higher than 0.9. So Bitcoin's relatively cheap. It's not really cheap, but it's, you know, it's pretty cheap. If it were down around 0.65 like it was a couple weeks ago at 6,000, 
then yeah, that would be super cheap, and that would be a great time to buy, at least statistically, uh, if you still bought the fundamental thesis of it. And you can apply the mayor multiple to any price exchange ratios out there. You know, dollars, oil, uh, gold, Dow, like whatever ratios you want to. That's interesting. You know, maybe that Meyer multiple will become cheaper if some of the commercial scale Bitcoin miners, maybe some of the Chinese miners who use debt, some of that artificially cheap debt in China from their credit bubble to go and buy Bitcoin mining rigs, they go bankrupt. Yeah, I mean, maybe, yeah, that, that could definitely happen. I mean, the miners, the miners that will go bankrupt are the marginal miners, the ones that are kind of on the marginal profitability curve. And then, of course, as the Bitcoin price kind of goes down and stays down over a period of time, it starts flushing them out because it, it basically just bleeds them out. And, and that's a good thing. It's healthy to, to reallocate the capital from people that are, you know, not very effective at managing it to those who are more effective at managing uh, and using the capital. So since the last couple of months we talked, I think we talked last in March or April, has there been any new significant breakthroughs or updates in the Lightning Network beta testing? Oh, it's been extremely positive. Uh, I think over the last six months, it's gone from 61 Lightning Network nodes to over 10,000. Uh, Andreas, uh, Reckless Andreas, he's uh, not Andreas Antonopoulos, a uh, different one, Andreas Brecken. He, he spun up a Lightning Network node, put like a bunch of Bitcoin on it, uh, then closed them all, wrote up how he did it. It was kind of like a good stress test on the, on the Lightning Network. Uh, everything seemed to work relatively good, uh, you know. So they're they're working out what bugs are there. Um, I, you know, for people who've actually used Lightning Network, like you can use it at Bit Refill. You can buy Skype credit or you can buy eBay gift cards, stuff like that. Uh, there's an exchange now that accepts Lightning Network deposits. So you know, Bitcoin's Bitcoin's getting these additional layers built out. And that's the thing. People have to understand, like, this takes time to build and extensify this software and to do it right and to do it secure. And that's, you know, what's happening is Lightning Network is, is fundamental technological innovation that's happening, and it's getting done. And, and it's not just vaporware. Like, you can use it right now today also. And there hasn't been any major losses of Bitcoin now of actual Bitcoin on Lightning Network because I remember you said in March when we when I asked you the same question you said there was about fifty thousand dollars at the time of real Bitcoin trading. Uh, obviously, I think there's more than that now, and none of that uh, significant amount, none of it has been lost yet. Um, at, at least as far as I understand, no. It it seems to be uh, just humming along, no significant losses on it. Um, I, there, there is a website that keeps the Lightning Network stats, but I forgot the name of it off the top of my head, and that's where people can go and, you know, you can see a lot of the stats that are going on and what's happening with it and all of that. So if governments, I know a lot of governments are starting to really crack down on initial coin offerings, thank God, because a lot of, well, actually, I would prefer free market activity, but a lot of people don't take responsibility for their actions anymore, so they want the government to do it. But, um, you know, there was a lot of fraud in the initial coin market. There's huge regulations. Do you think that all of these things, these extra uh, people going to prison for fraud for initial coin offerings and extra reg regulations on initial coin offerings. Do you think that Bic benefits Bitcoin in the long run? Uh, I mean, it's just another network effect, you know, getting regulation in place. That's part of the sixth network effect. Uh, how it takes place, does it stifle innovation? Does it, uh, you know, th these are all questions that are big question marks and usually when the government get involved in stuff they screw it up kind of like the post office so you know i'm not too i don't i'm not too <laughs> i don't i don't think they're going to do a very good job just because you know that that's what bureaucrats do they bureaucrat but you know bitcoin and the economy and people's entrepreneurship is just so resilient that you know i think we could see you know, I think I think despite what regulators do, Bitcoin is going to survive and thrive because it's such a powerful innovation. So last question today, because we're doing a shorter interview with an update on Bitcoin. I think it's just interesting to follow the progress of everything that's happening. Uh, this is also a question from Phil Kennedy, my friend Phil Kennedy, Kennedy Financial, who co-hosts Welcome to Dystopia with me. So who first told you about Bitcoin and what was your initial reaction to it? 
Well, nobody told me about Bitcoin. Remember, I was the first person who started publicly talking about it in any who had any significant uh, platform. You know, otherwise it was just small chatter on a cryptography emailing list for the most part. Um, but you know, that's just kind of how this grows. It it it's grown very virally and just very grassroots and very person to person. What yeah, was the it, other part of it? it? Oh, I was just. Uh, it was. What was your reaction to it? Well, since you found it first, there was. It's not like someone told you, and you're like, no, shut up. That that was like what what you told me when you told me about Bitcoin. I don't have a technology background. I have a finance background. So when you were trying to explain the technological stuff to me, I think it was early 2011, and it just went totally over my head. I was like, I don't understand anything he just told me. <laughs> yeah, well, that's definitely been a lot of people's cases with Bitcoin, and. It's unfortunate, but at the same time, it's everybody's got to develop their own type of human capital, and you have to, you know, you have to learn how to use Bitcoin too, like not just kind of understand it, but actually use it. Be a first-class Bitcoin citizen by having a full node and your own private keys. Uh, you know, these are all important aspects of if you've invested in yourself then you have that optionality to take advantage of stuff when it crosses your path. But if you're not prepared for things, uh, or if your mind isn't open, like a parachute, it's just not going to work. And, uh, and so, you know, it's kind of unfortunate. But at the same time, this is just how the market works. You know, and those who calculate correctly economically, they have profits, and those who don't have losses. And that's just, that's just the way the market figures out the winners and losers, you know, and, and it just is what it is. Yeah, I think it's a really exciting time now still with a lot of free market activity. There's a lot of computer developers that are excited about cryptocurrency and especially Bitcoin. But do you think that – so on, on all of our interviews for the last year or so, you've, you've expressed how you think that Bitcoin still has a lead in terms of the quality of computer programmers and developers. Do you still believe that or do you think that other altcoins are closing the gap? Uh, yeah, definitely. The Bitcoin still has the lead on that. The, the fifth network effect of developers. And remember, these network effects all exponentially reinforce each other. And, you know, not only does the base layer of Bitcoin have tremendous developers on it, but now the second layer with Lightning Network has amazing developers working on that. People like Roast Beef and Rusty Russell and Elizabeth Stark and the AC Inc. guys. And then we've got people like Jonas Nick, who's actually already started brainstorming how we start building the third layer with Chami and eCash servers that settle into Lightning. Like, I mean, this is just amazing stuff, like building out the tech stack. And uh, and so, you know, none of, the, none of these other coins... They, they don't even have any like significant development going on with their second layer stuff, you know, and then except some of the coins are just copying lightning network. But like, what good is that going to do? Not going to give you any particular advantage over Bitcoin, just copying the homework. And then you, then it's whether the, the developers that they have are competent enough to copy the homework. And it's really funny kind of watching Bcash because, you know, they're all like, oh, well, we can just roll Lightning Network in. And it's like, well, not really because you guys took SegWit out. <laughs> you know, so, so it's really kind of, you know, the devil is definitely in the details on a lot of this stuff. And it's really, it's just such an exciting time to be, uh, to be kind of, building the future and building the new financial and monetary system that will hopefully be the hardest money the world has ever seen. Now, some computer programmers claim that proof of, uh, proof of stake is more efficient. It uses electricity and that proof of work is, you know, cumbersome. But I've also heard the argument that, you know, proof of work with the Byzantine general and making it difficult to to actually mine the coin economically is one of the reasons why it prevents a 51% attack. I think game theory is also involved. So how would you respond then to the people that are saying that proof of stake is going to overtake proof of work and it's going to make Bitcoin obsolete? I don't see any reason why people should trust proof of stake. Um, and... Like, where's the cryptographic provability? Uh, you know, you, you just, like, Bitcoin's got this massive blockchain. You can cryptographically prove everything, like, all the way back. And then you're, you're able to calculate, like, how much electricity and mining power it takes to start, like, you know, trying to do these reorg attacks. And, I mean, if we're talking about, you have to have a secure base layer. 
Uh, and that's really what digital gold is, you know, the digital gold use thesis. And if you don't have that secure base layer, and I don't, I don't, if you're not going to use proof of work, I don't know what you're going to use. I mean, you're going to use proof of stake. Like, why trust that? I mean, like the burden of proof is on on people who want to assert that you should trust that. Bitcoin's proven immutable over eight years, despite highly contentious hard forks going on, like just a massive like mess in terms of all of this stuff but bitcoin has proven so resilient and so unchangeable like really the burden of proof is on any other coin or any other assertion like to 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 lay out like why that might possibly work and you know that's not to say that you know it's a great thing that the bitcoin network's using all this electricity but at the end of the day maybe the highest and best use of electricity is not powering somebody's tesla or their television but it's you know running the bitcoin network and if you don't have bitcoins then maybe you just aren't going to be able to afford electricity anymore and if if you talk to some of the commercial scale bitcoin miners because i've asked a few of them this question about electricity they say well they're using if they're operating in iceland they're using geothermal power uh they've set up uh pretty self-sufficient solar panels and they're working on alternative energy solutions. So it's not it's not all fossil fuels uh, with the electricity generation. They're working on more efficient solutions that are somewhat self-sustaining compared to fossil fuel power generation for the Bitcoin money. Yeah. They're working on offsetting that. Yeah, but over a longer term time horizon, all electricity is electricity if it's going to run the, the computer and all hash power is kind of treated the same by the Bitcoin network. Right now, the the plays in mining have been finding cheap electricity that otherwise isn't very commercialable. You can't really monetize it very well. But eventually, those inefficiencies are going to get squeezed out. And then mining is going to start competing with other use cases. And, and that's where it's going to get really fun, especially if the Bitcoin price goes up a bunch. Because it's going to just justify, you know, using so much more electricity and diverting it from stuff like you know, powering a Tesla or a TV to instead securing the blockchain. And that just kind of is what it is. But, you know, like, hey, it's a free market. And and that's, you know, Bitcoin's either censorship resistant or it's not. And if it is, then it's going to break the, the economic censorship that's taken place. And that's primarily, you know, fiat currencies, fractional reserve banking. But also think of all the interference in the electricity markets. You know, this was like WorldCom, right? And, well, not WorldCom, but Enron. And some of the largest bankruptcies ever in history uh, came because they were trying to game the electricity markets. And Bitcoin just forces delivery of the electricity and it just turns it into these precious numbers that become blocks and you know it's proof of work you know none of this proof of stake garbage like you actually have to deliver electricity to make blocks like this is this is real yeah satoshi designed it to be hard intentionally similar to like how gold mining is hard it was designed as digital gold intentionally i believe the algorithm right the algorithm changes so sometimes it's easier to mine and sometimes it's harder to mine so the algorithm is designed to shift as well yeah based on how much hashing power is there and it do it changes about every two weeks so you know it's auto self-correcting and this allow that this enables bitcoin to become the hardest money ever because you could have the price of Bitcoin go to $100,000 and you're not going to produce any more Bitcoins than, than you otherwise would have produced. You might produce them a little bit faster, but that's it. But if gold went to $100,000 a coin, you'd have every gold mine on the planet just producing tons of gold. And then we'd be trying to figure out how to mine asteroids and, and get gold out of the oceans and all types of stuff. You know, none of that with Bitcoin. There's a certain amount of Bitcoin. It's going to get distributed. You can maybe have it come a, a little bit faster, uh, but not by much. And, and you have to deliver actual electricity in order to make those new Bitcoins. Like, no paper games. And there's crazy stories of Bitcoin mining in Venezuela, and they have price controls on their electricity. So you have Venezuelans who are trying to survive mining, uh, you know, mining cryptocurrency there, saving their lives or buying food, trying to maybe buy some way out of the country. And then the government employees like the police, secret police or the bureaucrats find out that the people, certain people are mining a lot of Bitcoin. And then they go and steal the mining rigs. 
Yeah, well, that just, uh, you know, that's part of the risk of being in that particular geography, you know, and, and people should be taking that into account in their economic calculation. And not just with Bitcoin, but, I mean, you're going to have to start taking this into account with pricing of real estate. Like, look at the state of Illinois or Pennsylvania. You know, they're, get, they're starting to saddle their real estate property owners with huge taxes in order to fund these bankrupt pensions. You know, like, why do you want to own real estate there? You know, I mean, so, so you know, Bic, like, it's not just Bitcoin that, that gets repriced when you start having collapse of rule of law and property rights. It's every other asset. And Bitcoin's a major beneficiary to any type of erosion or evaporation of those property rights used to have how to vanish and you know the new normal especially in the developed world in europe and the united states is higher inflation that the governments are going to lie about in the statistics and higher taxes they're going to be layering taxes on pretty much everything and that's why you're seeing people move out of those old states like uh old mostly democratic states that used to have a lot of money in old industries like new york new jersey illinois michigan etc people a lot of people are even leaving california yeah with good reason these places are a disaster uh, politically, you know, well, why God. why take on that type of risk in terms of building a business and having real estate there? There's not really much of a future to build there because they've already basically just promised it to pension retirees. Exactly. And, well, California, from a from geography, weather, agriculture, they they should be an economic paradise and and great weather, and you can do all these nice things, but the, the politicians and the bureaucrats have pretty much destroyed things there. You cannot like start a business from scratch there, unless you're a technology company and you're getting all this funding, but if you're a normal business, you can't really start and grow a business there. You're gonna get taxed and regulated to death. Yeah, I mean, California is a great place to visit, but you don't wanna live there, you don't wanna build a business there. Uh, and so, yeah, I completely agree. I used to live in California for a long time. I grew up there, but uh, I, I still have an I still have an accountant friend there, and he told me no, don't move back, <laughs> don't move back until things change. So, so Trace, do you think then the prop one of the main problems with proof of stake, you think, is that it will be more vulnerable to fifty one percent attacks? I'm not tech savvy, so for our listeners out there, you think that's going to be one of the major problems with proof of stake? Why it's going to fail? I I just don't see a reason to trust it. Like it's very circular to me. Uh, you know, whereas when you have proof of work, like you're able to calculate how much it costs to run a 51% attack approximately, you know, and so, and there's even a website that shows you approximately how much it costs to run these things. Whereas like proof of stake, like I, now, now you introduce potential coercion uh, by government actors. Uh, I mean, it like it, it has a whole bunch of potential security flaws and vulnerabilities that just aren't there with proof of with proof of work and i like the idea of having to actually deliver electricity in order to produce new bitcoins or or whatever cryptocurrency i mean that that means that you actually like there are no paper games that you can play with this you know and proof of stake also uh does not seem to be the fairest way to uh, reward actors or stakeholders in the ecosystem for securing the network. So, you know, there's, and, and then we've seen quasi hybrids of this stuff like Dash and its master nodes and, and all types of things, you know, to shift some of the incentives and the, and, and whatnot. But at the end of the day, like proof of work, it's elegantly like complex and simple. <laughs> And that's why Bitcoin is a digital version of gold, in, in my opinion. I think Satoshi did a wonderful job with that. As my listeners know, it is very, very difficult to mine physical gold and silver. The gold grades are so low now that we are moving moving 2,000 pounds of uneconomic rock or a full ton to get one tiny little gram of gold. So that's how difficult. And so then you have to separate out the ore and you have to use chemicals and truck the ore and it's very very time consuming and very very expensive and i think uh that's the way bitcoin was designed yeah i mean gold is uh you basically just turn coal and oil into gold you know you turn electricity into gold i mean that's what that's what these miners do and you know bitcoin is very similar except it's even more efficient at doing it and you have a lot less economic uh environmental damage than you do with gold because you know you're not dealing with a lot of these chemicals and everything 
Well, your wealth of information, Trace, and we'll have to have you back on again in another couple months for more updates on Bitcoin. It's such an exciting market. It's the Wild West. Uh, just the listeners, you know, I, we tried to warn you. We've been warning you all on all of our interviews, Trace, to stay away from this initial coin offering market. I'm still getting spam like crazy, even though the cryptos for months now were going down. I was still getting like offers to make reviews and get paid in all kinds of initial coin offerings from all different kinds of countries. Yeah, I mean, I stay away from them too, and I try to warn people that they're giant scams, and and you want to be a hodler and have your own private keys and run your own full node, and uh, you know, it's <laughs> it. People have to take personal responsibility for their own situation, and that's just kind of is what it is. Amen. But that's not the new normal we're in now. We're in the new normal now where a lot of people, even adults, will blame other people for all of their problems. But I want to thank you again for your time today, Trace. And if our listeners want to follow your work at the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, how do they do so? Uh, that's www.bitcoin.kn and then also on Twitter at Trace Mayer. Great. Well, thanks again for your time and keep up the great work teaching people about Bitcoin. Well, you also, thanks so much for having me, and uh, you keep up the good work too. Please like this video, share it with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe to the Wall Street for Main Street YouTube channel if you have not already done so. Thanks for helping Wall Street for Main Street pass the 20,000 YouTube channel subscriber milestone despite YouTube censorship. Hopefully, we'll be able to get to 30,000 or even 40,000 YouTube channel subscribers quickly if YouTube doesn't shut down this channel. If YouTube does shut down this channel, remember to also sign up for the Wall Street for Main Street email list that's on the wallstreetformainstreet.com website and will tell you where the videos are going to be uploaded instead of YouTube. Also, if you really like the content and you decide that you want to give a one-time donation, you can go to the wallstreetformainstreet.com website where there's different options for you to do so. Or you can become a Patreon contributor. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to providing my loyal listeners with some of the best information, analysis, and financial education available out there, free or paid, as I work to grow the podcast and also get my educational technology company funded.